Jesus, we thank you that you are here. We cannot see you with our physical eyes, but with the eyes of the Spirit, we can see you. We will picture you now standing on those steps with your arms outstretched in blessing. And we will dare to imagine, to vision, your healing power entering into every one of us. And if we sufficiently expect this, and if we strive with all our hearts to keep your laws and walk in your ways, then it will be so. We also hold up before you now the one for whom we are particularly praying. Having already asked, we just give thanks and offer ourselves again as channels that your light and love may continue to work in this person toward that picture of wholeness that we see in our minds by faith. And we give thanks, O Lord, believing that this will be so. Amen. You know, one way, do you know that symbol? <laughs> one way. In California, I passed a card one time that had a bumper sticker on it that said, Honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> so I honked, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> and I passed by, and there was a car full of young people beaming, and every one of them, you know. So I went by like this. You know, I think that is absolutely glorious. In the middle of the traffic to recognize each other and give each other the signal. Oh, I just think it is glorious. You know, those young people say that Jesus is coming again. <laughs> Do you believe it? Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> He is. Now, they expect him probably day after tomorrow, no later. <laughs> I am not one who really pretends to understand the prophecies, and I don't know. But this I do know. He is at the present time coming again in a surge of love and power and new life. It's the most amazing thing I have ever seen. I just tell you this for your comfort and for your joy and for another reason, too, which I will presently mention. I won't spend too long talking about it, although really and truly I think this movement of the Jesus people is the most exciting thing I've ever known in my whole life. I really do. But I will tell you this, it is real. It is not a publicity stunt. In fact, you have to search to find out where the kids are. <laughs> meeting here, meeting there, meeting somewhere else. But this, I can tell you, it is real. Now, I had a young man whose mother brought him to see me, for me to pray for him. He had, I don't know really whether he had taken LSD for a long time or whether what he says is true. He says he didn't take it for a long time, but apparently he took too much and it injured his brain. <coughs> well, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, this is not exactly my thing, you see. I mean, <laughs> this is new. You remember in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul says there are gifts of healing. Notice the plural. Some people have more gift along certain lines. Now, I don't know why, but that's the way it is. Some things that might seem difficult to some people, to me, are just a pushover. Now, that really is true. Mental depression, any kind of aberration like homosexuality, nothing to it, just easy. But then other things, to me, are difficult. So, I failed. Oh, the Lord, I was not a usable instrument, and... Uh, the chap, oh, he was a little better, but then I went away and he slid back and he was just as bad as ever. 
And he um, ended up in a mental institution, and then when he got out of that, he went to some sort of rehabilitation place. And, uh, and there, he tried to cut his wrists. He did cut his wrists, but they caught him before he bled to death, and he was in a hospital. I had failed. So had his doctors, so had his ministers. You know who went and got him? <laughs> the Jesus people. Yeah, two or three of those kids found him in the hospital, prayed for him, were able somehow to show him Jesus in a new way. Just before I left, he was allowed to come home, and I saw him, and I declare, he's a young fellow anyway, but he looked ten years younger. He looked entirely reborn. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And he, well, his mother asked. She had to drive him because he's still not allowed to have a driving license. But uh, he will be pretty soon. They just got to make sure he's okay, you see. And his mother said to me somewhat timidly, she said, you know, he would like to be baptized. Uh, and she sort of looked at me to see if I would be shocked. And I said, wonderful. I don't think this fellow has been baptized. Now, you'll be shocked. I don't care whether he has or not. I would still think it wonderful for him to be immersed in the Pacific Ocean. You know, when they have a baptism service, they don't do it lightly. They teach those kids for months. And a friend of mine who went down there said that he was never more surprised on a Sunday morning. There they sat for two hours with their Bibles in their hands, taking notes while the minister taught them out of the scriptures. You know, they don't spend the whole time hooping and hollering. They really learn. And when they're sufficiently prepared, why, they go down to the Pacific Ocean and they have a baptism service. And last time they baptized a thousand. And the police come along and think, what are the kids up to now? <laughs> because there are thousands of others lining the shore and lining the bluffs, you see. And they say, oh, we're just having a baptism service. <laughs> But, you know, they come up out of that water healed. I mean, instantaneously healed even of being a mainliner. Now, that doesn't mean someone who lives between Philadelphia and New York. <laughs> they come up absolutely radiant with joy. One time I went to another one of the groups. The young friend wanted to take me, and I said, well, where are they? You see, I didn't know. So he named several, and I said, well, which is the noisiest? <laughs> he said, I guess the Hollywood gang is the noisiest. So I said, okay, take me then. Well, now, well, I shouldn't take the whole time telling you about them, but I will just say, I have never in my life no CFO could equal it. I have never in my life seen such joy and ecstasy, such radiance in the Lord Jesus. Never. Now, this is a commune. This is a Christian commune. And these were the absolute lost ones. They were the complete dropouts. They were all of them on, well, not all, but a great many of them were on drugs and so on and had been for many years. They were searching for something different. They didn't know what. And they went all the way down, down, down until there was no further down to go. <laughs> And then they found Jesus. And when they found Jesus and were transformed, then nobody from outside had to tell them. They knew from inside that now they changed their way of life. No more fooling around. No more sleeping with this one and that one. No more taking drugs. They knew from inside that now they'd found Jesus, and he had found them. It was up to them to play the rules of the game. And furthermore, they wanted to. In their spare time, in the daytime, they get on a bus and go into Hollywood, and they roam up and down, <laughs> you know, what's that street? Yes. And they are missionaries. They grab people up and convert them. Now, I wouldn't have the nerve, but praise God. <laughs> 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 
So they know from inside they have to keep the rules of the game. Now, there are some rules to this game of being Christians and being filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many of these kids have had the experience you call the baptism and how many have not, because that aspect is not emphasized. The thing that is emphasized is Jesus, the very center, the substance of the whole of everything, of everything, <laughs> one way, the substance of everything. But you know, there are rules to the game. And when we pray the prayer of faith, as we talked about last night, and we're going to continue to do it, and isn't it wonderful, you do have your things memorized, your, your, your mimeographed, your little statements. I have forgotten. I sent them to Helen Carnes three weeks ago, and bless her heart, she did it, and that's so there you are. All right. Now, that is just to help you to get to get this into, to release the power that is in your deepest mind, to, to just, uh, well, just release, just let go of that stored up power in you. Oh, there's one other thing I want to tell you about that. At this business conference that I went to, uh, the leader of it, John Lodge, said to these businessmen, after he gave them this suggestion about making these statements in the morning and at night, you see, he said to them, now, just in case any of you think that you are already using your full potential, you know, all that is possible for you, that's fine. That's great. He said, this hotel has a very fine swimming pool. We'll all be delighted to come down in the morning and watch you walk on the water. <laughs> You see, we are not yet walking according to the full power. Peter preached a sermon that converted 3,000 people in one day. Have you ever done that? Nope. Well then, all right. People say, filled with the Spirit. That's not quite accurate. We're not filled, because we haven't done that yet. <laughs> Peter and John stretched out to the hand to the man born lame and said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. And he arose and walked and leaped and ran into the temple. You know, I still hope to see that while I'm here on this earth, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I haven't seen it yet. You know, I'm honest with you. I'm not going to tell you anything that I do not absolutely know from my own experience to be the truth. I'm not the say a little prayer and forget it type. I frankly admit that some things I know Jesus would do if he were here in the flesh. I know he wants to do them. I know there is will. I haven't seen him yet. How come? Well, I think one reason is we are not operating alone, you and me. We are trying to be channels for the power of Jesus, but we are part of the whole body of Christ. We are part of the whole church, you see. And I think when the time comes when the whole church is filled with new life and new power and new faith, and when we can all work as one, then I think these very things will happen. Now, of course, they may happen day after tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> because I don't limit it to that. But I do think that then, that it is possible and it will be. Now, one reason I told you about this tremendous wave of new faith and new power that's coming among the young people is, look, you older ones. You've been praying, some of you, for new life in your church, haven't you? Well, all right. Here it is. You have a resource of new power. You have a channel of new power. What are you going to do about it? Get upset because they have long hair and bare feet? I know a church in Toronto where a great many of these young people, they don't call themselves the Jesus people, uh, but a great many of them come to church. And an uh, uh, elegantly dressed gentleman was there one time, and one of the kids came in like that, and he said to this kid, how do you dare to come into this church with long hair and bare feet? And the senior warden who was standing by said to this man, How do you dare come into this church with short hair and other shoes? Jesus didn't. He came in with long hair and bare teeth. <laughs> 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 
and yet I would say that most churches well one of two things or maybe both they are standing in the way in most churches they would look askance at uh, a gang of these young ones coming in they would but here's the other part of it a lot of these kids wouldn't find one single thing in church <laughs> they really wouldn't <laughs> They think, well, what's this? I mean, <laughs> they wouldn't feel there the power and the joy. And yet they desperately need the church. They desperately need you older people. Because, look, my friends, suppose Jesus doesn't get here by day after tomorrow. And suppose time goes on and the things they think will happen so instantaneously they may find that they take a little longer. I don't know, but I feel that they need older people to sort of be friends to them and guide them. And this I know for sure. You need them. Here is new life, so what can you do? Well, here is one thing that is very, very simple to Christian people. Well, <laughs> it's so simple it's ridiculous to say it. Just be friends, that's all. <laughs> And then to ministers or senior wardens or vestry or those who have any authority in the church, I would say, at least here's something you could do. In many places, these kids need a place to meet. Like in Rye, New York, you know, it busted loose there. Now, nobody plans this. Nobody organizes it. It just happens. And someone from there was visiting in the West and caught it from a young friend in the West and came home and took it to young kids there. And they are absolutely thrilled with Jesus. Why didn't they find Jesus in their churches? I ask you. All right, you figure it out. And this is not altogether the responsibility of the minister of the church. It's the responsibility of every one of us who goes to church. So anyway... They meet here and there in somebody's living room. One businessman said that uh, he was off on a business trip and he heard about this and he didn't know what in the world to expect when he got home, whether the kids would be off somewhere uh, smoking, um, whatever it is you smoke, you know, <laughs> or something, <laughs> or what would be going on. But he said what he did not expect was to find 45 Bibles in the living room and the promises of Jesus pasted on every mirror. <laughs> So in that church, my friend Joe Bishop of the Presbyterian Church is thrilled with this. And when his son told him that he'd found Jesus, Joe shed tears of joy. And I don't know exactly what he's done, but I'm quite sure that as happens in some places, the church at least gives these kids a room. They don't say necessarily, you must come to church and be like us. <laughs> but sometimes they say, look, you can use the parish house, or here's a room over here, and when you want, want to meet... Why, here's a place. We'll give you a place where you can meet now. At least that. Because here are churches that are, some of them, dying of dry rot. Not to put too fine a point upon it. They are. That's just all there is to it. And here is a source and a rush of new life. And it would be the utmost tragedy if in some way or other each did not find a way of helping each other because each needs the other in a way. So now there is one of the challenges and one of the joys and one of the glories of this life. Now I want to swing into a subject that's a little different and yet it follows right on from this. As I said in the beginning, there are rules to this game. And one of the dangers of some people who come to camps and so forth and they get filled with the Spirit is that sometimes they forget that they're rules to the game. And they think that they have a right to what they call follow their own guidance. Now, in some cases that works out all right, but in other cases it doesn't. 
If you were playing baseball and you made a strike and then started to run around to the left instead of the right, running around bases three, two, and one instead of one, two, three, uh, there'd be no good telling the coach that you were following your guidance. <laughs> because that simply is not the way that the game is played. There are certain rules. And first you learn the rules and you keep the rules. Then if guidance can help you to keep the rules and play more brilliantly, fine. And so it is in the Christian life. There are certain rules. And uh, we do not need to follow guidance all the time, what we call guidance. Because let me tell you, it's very difficult to know who is guiding. Amen. Hmm. Not every voice that you hear is the voice of God. No. Just recently I heard, well, I've heard this more than once, but I heard of a young woman supposed to be very, very, very fine and spiritual, <clears throat> several children and so on said that God guided her to give her body to some other man because he needed that comfort and consolation and so forth. And, uh, poor dear, of course it has resulted in the breaking up of the family and all that, you see. Now, how can I know for sure that God did not guide her to do that? And how should she have known that that was not the voice of God, but was the voice of Satan? She should have known because there's the set of rules. It's not too far away. She should have checked it by the set of rules. Nothing that goes contrary to the rules is guidance from God. Now, you know what the rules are. And they are not death-dealing. They are life-giving. They are beautiful and good. The law of the Lord is perfect, rejoicing the heart. And you know what the rules are, and they still hold good just as much as they ever did. God gave these rules to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. You know, I love that story, although, as I do with all stories in the Bible, I like to wonder what words we would put it in. Something terrific happened on top of that mountain. <laughs> there was a burst of glory. There was a tremendous outpouring of a spiritual power so that the whole mountain was covered with the smoke of it and the fire and the whole mountain shook and so on. When I was a little girl, I used to think God was very mean because he said nobody should go up the mountain except Moses and Aaron. Then you remember Aaron chickened out and stayed below and got into a lot of trouble. Um, and in fact, it said there that no one should even touch the mountain or they'd be put to death. I thought, oh, how savage, how mean. But you know now, I wonder... I bet that mountain was radioactive. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this was just simply a warning of a danger of some kind. Because terrific things were happening up on that mountain. And look, Moses had sufficient faith and sufficient power to be taken care of. Well, at any rate, there was Moses and God revealed to him these laws. And they were written down on tables of stone. I don't quite think it was like the pictures in the Sunday school books. There came Moses toddling down from the mountain, you know, hauling two huge tombstones with scrolls around the top. <laughs> but after all, he didn't have a typewriter up on that mountain. <laughs> He didn't even have a fountain pen. And I've seen layers of sandstone no thicker than, oh, just an eighteenth of an inch. And I imagine that really and truly, uh, either through a miracle of God's doing or Moses' inspiration by God's help, from God those laws were written down on those tables of stone. But you know, even before those laws were written down on those tables of stone, they are already written inside of us. You remember I told you yesterday you are not only a physical being, you're also a spiritual being. Well, your spiritual being knows the laws. Now, you know, I'm going to say something I wouldn't dare say in most places, but you're used to people that are very far out. <laughs> 
And anyway, this is just me wondering. I do not know. But I wonder whether your spiritual body did not already live in heaven. Now, not on earth. You know, none of that. I mean, <laughs> how horribly dull that would be to be reincarnated again and again on this earth. Oh, no, I don't believe that at all. <clears throat> if I were have to have to do another turn on some earth, I'd at least rather choose a different planet. So, <laughs> so I don't mean that, but I wonder whether your spirit or spiritual body might have lived in God's light and in God's presence before you were ever born in the world. Now, you don't have to even wonder about this unless you want to. But some of you may wonder for the same reason that I do. Because some of you may occasionally sort of remember a little something. Have you ever felt like that? Well, who knows? It could be. So when you came, you already had this knowledge inside of you sealed up. A sealed up knowledge. And Moses only wrote down on tables of stone what was already there. Just for fun, as I'm talking on this this morning, I've got the words of the law bound upon me. Remember it said in Deuteronomy that you should bind them on your foreheads. Well, you might look a little funny that way. But somebody gave me that. There's Moses and the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so they bound them. Well, so they still hold good. And yet, in the present day, there is a tremendous campaign by the enemy. I am sure it is inspired by the enemy. Now, there is an enemy. You know that, don't you? There is a Satan. There is a devil. So Sinclair Lewis says that Satan's cleverest trick is to make people believe that there isn't any Satan. Oh, yeah, then he can sneak up on you unawares. Now, when you know there is, you don't have to be afraid of him the least little bit because you have power and authority over him. And if you sense any of his temptations, either to do wrong or to sink back into depression or go back into old bad habits or something like that, all you've got to do is to say, get thee behind me, Satan. In the name of Jesus Christ, I tell you, go away. Now, that's not exorcism. He's not possessing you or anybody. He's just hanging around being a nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> and if you recognize temptation for what he is and what it is, and you tell him to go away, he's bound to go away. He has to. And because you, you have the power of Jesus Christ in your mind, in your imagination, or perhaps in your person, perhaps you even wear one or have one, Across the Christ, you hold up the cross to Christ in front of him, and you say, in the power and authority of the cross of Christ, I say, get, off you go. He's got to go. But there it is. There is this enemy. And when you recognize him for what he is, there's no trouble and no danger. But there are times when Christian people, like the poor young woman I spoke of, of don't recognize him for what he is because they've got this false idea, and that is that any notion that fits through their heads is bound to be from God. Now, you see, that is a mistake. In fact, while guidance is a wonderful thing, we only need it upon certain occasions. I don't have to ask God's guidance in the morning as to whether I've got to wash the dishes and make up the bed. I know I've got to wash the dishes and make up the bed. That is already settled. <laughs> we waste a lot of time if we really ask God to guide us about the routine of daily life. It is much more efficient to have a routine and then follow it. I'll tell you a sad story. Only once in all the years of being a minister's wife did I go to church without making my bed. And that once, a neurotic old lady in the church fainted during the sermon. <laughs> yeah. You've got it. I don't need to tell you. 
The vestrymen carried her out, and that's where they put her on my bed. <laughs> I don't very often lose my temper and yell into the phone. I've been told I'm not a very good phone talker. I know I'm not. I'm rather curt and so on. I'm, I'm busy. I don't particularly enjoy it. But however, I only once in my life really yelled on the phone. And that was one Sunday when I'd come back from a mission and I was very, very tired and I found myself extremely unpopular at home. My children and husband and the congregation, they all felt neglected. And uh, I had gotten breakfast and gone to early service and taught the Bible class and got the children off to Sunday school and gone to the 11 o'clock service and come back. And I was trying to put dinner on the table and the congregation were coming in the side door and coming in the front door and the phone rang. So I went to the phone and a voice said, mentioning his name, would you come to my, church, my city and do a mission? And I said, no, I'm never again going to do another mission. Bang. <laughs> and I hung up the phone. And I came back and my husband said, who were you talking to like that? I said, oh, I don't know. He said his name was Austin Pardue. <laughs> Well, most of you seem to know that he's a very well-known bishop. (laughs) I don't know whether that was really the Lord catching me up with it, but it just might have been. (laughs) It sure was a lesson to me. And so one does learn about uh, certain things, (laughs) that it's a good idea to keep uh, these rules in the Ten Commandments. Now, this one is just a very simple one. The ones I've mentioned is just a matter of routine, you see. But there are some of these rules in the Ten Commandments that nowadays people are really very, very, uh, well, they wonder. And there's this concerted effort, which I'm sure is inspired by the devil, to teach people they are not any longer true. And, of course, you know which ones I have in mind. Now, when Jesus came, he commented on what was said by them of old times. Certain things he corrected, but not in the Ten Commandments. Those stood for him. He didn't correct them. He did correct some of their penal uh, practices, some of their very, very severe laws. And he said, it is said by them of old times, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, love your enemies, forgive them that persecute you. He corrected that. But when he came to the Ten Commandments, he did not correct them and change them. He said, I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law, to fill it full of new power. And he added power to it and made it stricter and not less strict. For instance, in the Ten Commandments, do you know the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill? Jesus added to that. He said, in simple words, it's better not to even get mad and call your brother a fool or say to him, Grecha, which is some kind of a cuss word. Because if you do, if you even go that far, you're in danger. You let yourself get mad and ball him up, and you're in danger of getting madder and madder, and someday it might result in murder. So it's better to stop yourself right in the beginning, he said. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him. He did not mean by these comments you might as well go ahead and kill him, because if you get mad, it's just the same thing. We know he didn't mean that. I mean, any, any body would know he didn't mean that. But then when it comes to the seventh commandment, he said, it is said by them of old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh after a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. Now, I would translate that like this. I'm sure he did not mean that every floating of a a sort of a uh, feeling of eros, you know, is wrong. No, I'm sure he didn't mean that. But I think I know what he meant. In fact, I'm sure I know what he meant. Everyone who indulges himself in that kind of thinking and feeds upon it and builds upon it 
like, and I've had people tell me this, that they never sinned in this manner until they wandered into one of these bookshops where they sell this pornographic stuff, you know. I wish we were all as ignorant as the sailor who came in and uh, through the customs and the man said, do you have any pornographic material? He said, hell no, I don't even have a, have a pornograph. <laughs> we were all as innocent and ignorant as that. I wish I could go back about 10, 20 years when I never even heard the word. But I have had even ministers, not many, but a couple, come and tell me that that looking and lusting after things like that was their downfall and their destruction. And that's what Jesus meant. He didn't mean you might as well go on and commit adultery because you've already been thinking about it, you see. Any more than he meant you might as well go on and kill somebody because you've already been mad with him. He didn't mean that. He was warning us from the beginning to do our utmost to content our creative urge within the normal range of married life if we are married and if we are not, to content this creative urge as we can do with physical activity and exercise, with the enjoyment of beauty, with creativity on the mental level. And whatever is left over of it, to give it to God that he may sublimate it and lift it up and change it from eros to agape, you know, from the human kind of love to the divine kind of love, and transform it into the kind of power that goes forth to heal. Oh, he can do it. Oh, he can do it. The thing in itself is a tremendous and glorious and beautiful creative urge. But the misuse of it ruins it. And the good use of it, it adds power to everything in your life. Now, you older people, what many older people have said to me that they just don't know what to say to their son or their daughter or to young people about this. And, of course, we all know that in some circles, like in the... Jesus people, before they were Jesus people, they were hippies and they just sort of disobeyed, cast off all rules. But now that Jesus has come into them, they automatically, spontaneously, by themselves, get back on the beam and play the game. So, but when people say, well, what's the harm? You see, now that they have the pill, why, what's the harm? They're not going to have illegitimate children, so they might as well amuse themselves, and they say it's only physical, so what's the harm? Now, you see, here is the error. It is not only physical. Because there is your spiritual body, the merging of two physical bodies can be broken. Get up and go their way. The merging of the two spiritual bodies, in some mysterious way, cannot be. <coughs> so lightly broken. In other words, more simple words perhaps, the harm is to the spirit. The harm is to the soul. That's why in the Old Testament, when people like David sinned in this fashion, he said, in deep repentance, speaking to God, he said, against thee, thee only have I sinned. Well, you might think he'd sinned against Bathsheba, well, so he did, but the real one was he sinned against God. Because there was an injury to the soul, to the spirit. Now this can be forgiven and utterly, completely cleansed. So any of you, if you look back many years and you think where you did make such a mistake, don't be upset. Next time I talk, we'll get around to this tremendous subject of the healing of the memories and the wiping away by the blood of the Lamb of all these old things. So... As I say, don't be upset. It's going to be taken care of. But I say this mostly in hopes that you will know what to say to those who wonder, to your children and the children of your friends and so on. 
And you know, in the keeping of the laws of God, there is great reward. Now, even among counselors and psychiatrists, and this I know, let me tell you, I'm in a position to know most anything. (laughs) Well, I am. I bet you I've heard more than any of you ever have. I've heard enough to sink a ship. (laughs) And who do I hear it from? I hear it from the guys that get in trouble and the girls that get in trouble. Oh, I hear it. I get it right straight. Right straight. So, therefore, I know that there are counselors who are supposed to be responsible people, psychiatrists, medical doctors, even sometimes ministers, God help us, who tell young people that they might just as well go ahead. Uh, It gives them release, does their nerves good. Whoa, does their nerves good. Uh, It may seem too temporarily, but the burden of it gets worse and worse as time goes on. Anyway, I know that this kind of advice is handed on. And together with this, they say, well, but if you've got these impulses, why, well, you've got to follow them, or else you might get um, inhibition or frustration or something. Of course, I think a few inhibitions would do some people a lot of good. <laughs> <laughs> because inhibition simply means self-control. You make your own decision whose laws you will keep, and you keep them, you see. But what about frustrations? What about that, that you'll get all these frustrations and they'll do great harm to your psyche and so on? Now, I know that this all depends upon why you are doing it. You see? If you are doing it for the sake of Jesus Christ, you don't get frustration. If you're doing it because you want to, because you want to serve him, and because you like to do something difficult for his sake, then you don't get frustrations. Now, you know, I was telling you about these Jesus people, not that I know too much about them, but this one meeting that I went to, I only stayed two hours. It was going on all night. They were going to pray all night which it seems they do frequently, and then get on a bus and go into L.A. the next day and go up and down Sunset Boulevard and see what sinners they can catch. <laughs> Bless their hearts. Well, <clears throat> uh, but anyhow, when I went to this meeting, I was a little bit startled at some of the things that the man said. There was one older man there. All the rest were the young kids, and they did the whole service except this one talk. I wasn't too happy about his talk, to tell the truth. It sounded so kind of grim, you know. He said Jesus was coming, and he said they were going to have all kinds of persecutions and tribulations, and they might have to give their lives for him, and they might have to be tormented for his sake. And, you know, that didn't dim the joy of those young ones one single bit. They were so filled with the love of Jesus, they'd be glad to be tormented for his sake. They'd be glad to give their lives for him. Well, so if there is a torment and a distress sometimes in keeping these laws, if we really love Jesus enough, we can be glad to do it for his sake. And you know, maybe that is what the great tribulation is. Maybe that's what the persecution is. Maybe that's part of it that the laxness of society has made it harder and harder to keep these laws. And then when Jesus comes into our hearts, it is not always easy to do them, but we do them with joy. And we succeed with triumph and glory because it is for his sake. That depends, it depends entirely on that. Why are you doing it? For whose sake are you doing it? Now, one time... I knew a minister who was a very fine minister, very fine. His congregation simply adored him. And he had a wife and two children, and he fell in love with some woman in the church. And she had a husband and about four children, I think. And he was going to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist told him that he must 
divorce his wife and she must divorce her husband and they must get married because since he had this strong feeling, <coughs> he would get a frustration and it would do some harm to his psyche if he didn't. And you know, some people say, well, he had to do it because love is divine. Look, what kind of love is divine and what kind is satanic? And was that love to destroy the lives of a man and a woman and six children? Because I don't know anything more destructive than this kind of thing. And there again, I'm in a position to talk because I've heard it for 40 years from the people who were destroyed, and I know. Well, was that love? No. Was the feeling that he had toward this woman divine? It was of the same stream as the love of God, which is agape and which is pure and beautiful and glorious and which can most exquisitely, most marvelously include eros, or married love, and family love, and love of children. It was in the same stream, but it was deflected. So therefore, he did it. <laughs> you know what he's doing now to earn a living? Of course, he was removed from being a minister by his church. So he's earning li his living now by being doing marriage counseling. <laughs> Now look, I tell you, if he held himself within the bounds of what was right and good and moral and what was really loving to his wife and children and the other woman's husband and children, if he acted according to real love for the sake of Jesus Christ, and if he loved Jesus enough, he would not have gotten a frustration. This would have been a bit of a difficult experience, all right. It was a difficult experience for the early Christians to be thrown by the lions. <laughs> I really mean it. And I'm awfully glad personally that lions have gone out of style. <laughs> but nevertheless, we read and we know that they went with joy praising the Lord because they loved Jesus so much that they would endure even this for his sake. Now, if a person gives up eros, an illicit kind of love, the kind that would break up and destroy a marriage and wound the hearts of children, for the sake of the love of Jesus, then he does not get a frustration. He'll go through a time of sorrow. He'll go through a time of the persecution of the devil. Well, all right, what do you think life is? A Sunday school picnic? <laughs> There is tribulation. Jesus is coming again, and there is tribulation. It's not all easy. But they would go through with joy. They would go through with glory. And I tell you something else. It will be made up to them ten times anyway. Jesus said a hundred times. Here, I'm limiting it. <laughs> he did, you know. He said, whosoever gives up. Home or children or lands or goods or anything that he enjoys for my sake in the Gospels, he will be rewarded a hundred times here in this life, and besides that, life everlasting. So you see, we will not be led astray if we remember these two things. And the one is that these rules that were set down in the Ten Commandments. Well, not only in the Ten Commandments, they are written inside of you, inside of your spirit. So that if you do not keep them, while you may think at first you're leading a life that's gay and free, you'll go further down and further down and further down. Or if you don't do that, if you try to straighten up and fly right, until you receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, you trudge along, you plod along, but you'll be dragging chains. Now, you don't have to. In my next talk, I'll tell you how to break them off. And I believe they will be broken off now at this time. But nevertheless, that is the kind of thing that will happen. But if you give up these things 
And if you walk the highway for the sake of Jesus Christ, then there's no question whatsoever that you will go from strength to strength. That is how your power is increased. Now, Jim said you don't have to pray for more power. That's true. You have the potential of it inside of you. And I gave you yesterday one way in which it can be increased, a very simple way, your daily homework, just to break off from you the little chains that were there in childhood. And this works very slowly and very gradually, you see. You may not notice the difference for some months. After a while, you will notice the difference. I might say you could add on other statements if you want to. You could make up some others and put them on there. So that's a very simple one. And then here is the other one. And that is if you all love Jesus enough so you are willing to endure the persecution of the enemy for his sake and be triumphant, then the channel of your soul will widen and his power through you will increase and increase and increase. And you know, this is the way. There is one way. This is the way that the kingdom of heaven is going to come upon this earth. And there isn't any other way that I know. This is the way. Through every one of us loving Jesus and following Jesus and clearing out of our lives anything that would block his power. Because you see, all of these things that get in the way are blocks. So then the power will increase. And his... That gets through, I'll finish. (laughs) I take it that that means my time is up. (laughs) I'm psychic that way. (laughs) So thank you, Lord. We'll go in your joy and go in your light. And, oh, I think you're going to lead us to far places and great heights while we are here together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.